Welcome to the session of the Dea Film Festival. Uh, we are so privileged and honored to have three fantastic people with us today to discuss about film festivals and the relevance it has uh, in the impact of filmmaking and how we plan our careers. So um, um, welcome everybody. Uh, my hope is going, is going well with you. This is the safest place on earth, culture, and then Zoom. Um, and we're going to go through film festivals. Uh, this, this intends to be very dynamic. If you have any question, please go to the chat next uh, and we will be answering. If not right in the moment, we will have a Q&A session right at the end. We intend to go for over one hour uh, and it's going to be very interesting. I've been, I've been talking to these people for some time right now and I have a thousand questions in my head. So uh, be prepared to be surprised. So. Uh, what we're going to go is from smallest country, biggest country. So smallest country, let's go with Christine Dolhofer. Uh, there you go. Uh, she's the festival director of Crossing Europe uh, Film Festival in Leeds. Uh, this is a very nice city in Austria. Um, this is a festival to idiosyncratic, contemporary and sociopolitical outer cinema from Europe. It was born like the rest of the film festivals here in uh, uh, 2004. And Christine has the responsibility to 160 films and documentaries every year. Um, it's a small country, big festival, 700 people accredited. Um, and as they say, film festivals is to play an important role in bringing new positions and developments in film art and um, to a wider public for discussion, curating programs and films that too often, uh, too often despite the international success of, of some of the movies, uh, they can't find any place, um, mainly for economic reasons. Um, so they're doing an extraordinary job just giving them an audience, which is great. Um, we go to a bigger, a little bigger country, which is Iceland, and we have Frederick Boyer. He's in Paris, not in Reykjavik right now, but he's the head of programming of Reykjavik International Film Festival. Uh, this is a film festival that you can go and celebrate in the fall before it is too cold. And they have a new and progressive quality films supporting in, uh, innovation and filmmaking networking between professionals from various parts of the world and fostering social and cultural dialogue. If you're lucky, you can find Bjorn somewhere uh, if you not, you can go to get the golden puffin, which is like, you know, this little bird, very uh, beautiful, and it's been awarded to first and second time directors. And again, they were, you know, they were born in 2004, so they've been around for a while right now, and they host something like 100 films uh, during the week that the film festival takes place. And right now we move to the thir third country, which is a lovely country called Portugal, uh, very far from Spain, but still, uh, you can get there somehow. We have Fernando Basket with us, who is the head of programming of FEST, the new director's new film festival. This is a film festival that takes place uh, from the 4th to the 11th of October, more or less, in the beautiful city of Espino in Portugal. And, you know, if you know, FEST has become very quickly one of the leading showcases of groundbreaking films by emerging filmmakers, as well uh, as a platform for international films professionals up and coming and establish alike to come together and present their work despite their skills and, and create synergies, which is absolutely great and necessary. So um, thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, it's going to be exciting. It is so great to, to have uh, film festivals you can go and enjoy movies and, and, and share experience. Uh, but to make a film festival, it is complicated. And the first thing that you need to have is a, a vision, uh, you know, like, like, like a trademark, something that defines 
the idea of, of, of the film festival that you want to that you want to do. So for example, Christine, uh, what is the idea of your film festival? Why does it make it unique if we want to go to, um, to the Crossing Europe Film Festival? Uh, I think the first thing you have to uh, count in is uh, what is the situation in your country? Which festivals are already on the ground? And what is missing? And, uh, and when I was asked if I would like to, to start the festival in Linz, uh, in Upper Austria, um, I first discovered or, or checked uh, what's going on there. Uh, is there an art scene? Is, is there a filmmaking scene uh, um, already active? And I think it's very important to know your audience, to know uh, the people uh, in the city and of course, what is missing and what is missing locally, what is missing nationally and uh, how can we connect uh, with uh, the European film scene. So the idea was because before I was running the Festival of Austrian Films in Graz, another film festival, and I thought between the Viennale, the big one in Vienna, um, uh, there is something missing in between. Uh, means uh, young auteurs from uh, all over Europe to, to gather in Linz and to select uh, outstanding, um, eccentric uh, new voices of European cinema. And uh, to uh, implement also um, a, a program, um, a program section for a local artist, which means uh, artists from from the region, uh, to connect with the international filmmakers, which is I think very important to uh, find angles uh, to to attract and uh, to connect audience. Uh, maybe also amateur filmmakers doesn't matter if they are already professional filmmakers or not, but to connect film buffs uh, with uh, international guests. And the nice thing with young directors with first, second film is that they're really keen uh, to travel. They are really keen to attend and to, to uh, approach to, uh, to, to the audience. And so this is, was the key idea. What is missing is Aust in Austria, how can we uh, underline European uh, strengths uh, of auteur cinema and how to connect with the audience? Okay, so uh, it was about what it was missing and the connection between the local and, and the rest of the world, which is so, so important and necessary. Frederic, in your case, Reykjavik, what makes it so relevant? What is the idea behind the festival? You should. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm going to just talk about Reykjavik because I'm also running Les Arcs and Tribeca, okay. which is very good for the experience. But for Reykjavik, uh, I really think this is a, a very young, I mean, the audience is extremely young, between 25 and 34 or 35. And uh, it's really exciting because in uh, many film festivals, we are trying to bring back a young audience. But in Reykjavik, we have the young audience. And uh, also, it's a very small team, very well done. But I really think when the society is changing, with the virus, with the COVID, and what's happened in the world, I think we, I think personally, a festival should reflect a, what's happened in the world, uh, and to change, to be able to evolve and to change a section. For me, I really love music, and I think music and cinema is something which can work very well. Documentary about music, documentary about arts, bringing politics because people like. I mean, people really like to, to have Q&A with a, uh, with a meaning, with something important, but also people love to have a Q&A &A about a, a beautiful cinematic films. But I think it's quite important to, to stay uh, connected to, and also to new images. I'm not really on VR, but I really, in Tribeca, they are doing this experience. They have a section called Now dedicated to uh, very young filmmakers, I would say under 20 years old, who are making a film on just for internet. They, are, they don't know what is a set, they are doing the film for the net. And in the beginning, I was, uh, I was not believing it could work, but it's not only work, there is a market, there is a people who are interested in gaming, I know nothing about gaming, but say, yeah, this is, could be something maybe interesting to have a, a section to bring also people who are not doing something with a camera, but 
doing something maybe at home. So I think we, we all love to, not me, but I think we all aim to create a new, new section, new, to have something a little bit different every year. That is very interesting because I don't know if that happened in, 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 in your countries, but during the confinement here, uh, every day there was a lot of posts in Instagram and Facebook and YouTube of people yeah. in their houses exactly easy work it was amazing yeah and the people they don't even think they are filmmakers but for me they are <laughs> and for the audience they are really it's uh, accessible the audience will say okay you can do it i can do it and we festival we are here to to do the transmission sometime so yeah yeah it was it was a way of making a narrative of what was going on um yeah. you know i i remember when i when i first got out and I, and I had to go to the film festival after the confinement, it was so incredible to know the experience of people from all over the world, how they live the situation, how they still create narratives. Uh, so yes, very, very interesting. Fernando. Yes. Um, well, our festival, uh, as you mentioned, started in 2004. And perhaps the easiest way to explain the identity is to discuss it, how it started in the sense that it was started by people that had finished film school and they had two main problems. The first one, they didn't really have new out of the festival circuit support, much less the distribution system. Uh, and in Portugal at the time, there was no real festival focused on uh, new talent. There was in, even around the world, there wasn't that many. A lot of festivals had side sections where they exploited that uh, niche, let's say, uh, but it was it wasn't as widespread as it is as it is, as it is now, uh, and also they finished film school and they knew very well how to uh, lighten the scene, how to edit a film, etc. But they knew nothing about the film industry, so the idea was to create an event that would uh, support new talent or new filmmakers or new people that wanted to work in the film industry in those two uh, grounds. So. Uh, inevitably, we ended up developing a, f uh, a festival that uh, has all, it's ultimately three festivals or three events happening at the same time. You have the film festival in the conventional sense of the festival with a competition for first and second features and also for short films. And then you have uh, training activities with master classes and workshops with key people in the film industry from uh, big directors to uh, people who uh, work on uh, world sales agencies or uh, on promoting films, uh, etc. trying to cover as many different aspects of the industry as possible. And the third event is a, a sort of a pitching forum where, uh, where people go to the event with a project trying to get financing or some kind of support to make these uh, projects happen. So that's ultimately the trilogy that defines the event. Obviously, 17 years later, it has developed to more than that. And uh, the festival takes place in a very small town. Uh, it's a suburb of Porto, just 15 kilometers south of Porto, called Spin. Uh, and it's a very nice seaside town, an old fishing village that became a tourist resort. Uh, but it's still only 15,000 people, which uh, obviously limits you in, in terms of growth. So the idea was always to try and get people to come from outside to the festival. And that's ultimately how the festival ended up gaining its own uh, identity within the Portuguese uh, context. And what you end up with is a festival that is 80% foreigners. 80% of uh, our audience comes from uh, outside of Portugal, not even outside of Spain. So... Um, and I would say, you know, still talking about this identity, the thing that we value the most is actually the community that is created throughout one week that uh, for almost 24 hours a day, everybody's either watching a film or talking about a film, talking to a filmmaker, talking about possible projects. Uh, this from the industry perspective and then also kind of creating a bridge with the normal audience whatever that means um, who has the opportunity to actually get to see how this works there's a lot of myths around the film industry and there's a huge distance between audience and and the author and that's the main thing we want to try and erase as much as we can at least uh, I think we'll, we'll cover the myths and legends about film festivals. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I think it's really interesting when you mentioned this, 
Um, I, I, I teach also at university and one of the things that I see from new filmmakers is number one, um, they need to be encouraged to do and express themselves. And sometimes we tend to limit them very much. Like, you know, this has to be like this, this has to be like that, right? And then, uh, you know, when they finish, they just want to do something. Say, okay, what do we do next? When do we go? Uh, do we go to a film festival? How would we do submit? So how do you research from, um, from filmographies all over? Where do you go? Uh, do they contact through the website? Do you have people that look for a film somewhere? Is somebody telling you, look at this? Uh, Christine, shall we start with you? Uh, so actually, it's a mixture of everything. Uh, I mean, it's all about networking first uh, of all. I mean, there are a lot of rumors uh, on festivals, which film is uh, hot and you should see and which is a secret and a discovery. This is one part, uh, networking and talking to uh, film critics, uh, um, uh, curators, um, and of course, all these people who represent their countries with their films. Uh, all the film commissions, uh, filmmakers, uh, all of this. Then second, uh, second part is, of course, we got a lot of uh, submissions. You can uh, apply and, and, and submit the film. Uh, then it's it's worst to worst, uh, worst uh, mouse to mouse uh, um, rumor. I, I mean, people said, ah, why don't you apply it crossing Europe or, or so on. And over the years, I mean, I think all of us experienced it. There is a network also of uh, filmmakers who came maybe in the first, second year when they were young and they're still coming with, with their films because they like to attend, they like the, the festival atmosphere and the audience. So, uh, and of course, uh, reading uh, all the critics, all the lineups of festivals around the world, <laughs> then uh, festivals, Scope, Sinando, uh, all these uh, professional uh, platforms where you can watch films. Uh, it's, it's really a mixture of everything. So, and, and uh, that's, that's, we are truffle hunters, let's say. And, um, and, and it, what's nice, it's, it's uh, that the colleagues in the festival uh, field are very collaborative. We work together, we exchange ideas. Uh, we um, recommend films from our territories where we know maybe the filmmakers better than others. Uh, so it, it's, um, but I think uh, what's also important, I, I attend, and I think Frederick is doing the same and, and Fernando maybe as well. We attend a lot of working progress sessions uh, or uh, pitchings or uh, co-production markets where you already meet producers, directors of films which are not ready yet, but maybe in one or two years. Uh, and this is also very important. To, uh, I think I can really recommend to young filmmakers to be more active on all these markets and attend at all these markets. It's a very important marketplace to meet people. Even if you don't find partners for your project, it's very helpful for future projects maybe and to uh, to see how it works uh, out, outside of your uh, own box. Mainly people are working in their bubble and uh, don't experience the competition uh, out there. And uh, so that's that's very important. But I uh, just wanted to add uh, for the festival part that I think it's really important that we festivals, we bring films which are not seen normally in, in cinema because uh, it's easy to promote films which are anyway having a regular release in your country. It's very important to bring other voices and also to have this diversity uh, in uh, of, of, of territories and of course diversity in, uh, in terms of the subjects and uh, female male directors and so on. So uh, I'm on all levels uh, have uh, a diverse program. So that's it. Great. So I, I we can summarize: get out of your bubble, get out of your bubble, and go for the truffle hunters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Frederick. Uh, I, I, I agree with Christine. It's really a mix of uh, many things. Uh, personally, I really like to, to, to go to the producers I really like because I know they're going to produce something. This is my way to do it. I'm looking, of course, Cine Europa uh, and uh, going to the Works in Progress. And I, I really want to say something for the viewers. Uh, 
many uh, students they, they think we are not accessible we are we are looking for your films stop if you see us and tell us you are, you have a film it's exactly how it works and it's the reason why a festival it's extremely helpful and much more uh, uh, new directors, Linz or Reykjavik, because you're going to spend three, four days with someone in Cannes or Berlin or Toronto. It's impossible. You don't have, you don't have, you see so many people you don't remember. When you go to a festival with a good size, first the food is good, the mood is good, and there is something, it's a kind of a love story. It's a, it's a kind of affair. And I saw so many filmmakers and short filmmakers, they find their cinematographer, their film editor, they find an actor, maybe they were drunk, but it was fine. And this is the, the, the problem with Zoom, it's a little bit different. But festivals are here also to connect people, to make films. And of course, when uh, in Reykjavik, of course, it's small, but we have the freedom, we don't need to have, no, uh, to have a premiere. It has to be Icelandic premiere. So in a way, this is cool. And uh, with all the films which were made last year and not seen the choice is double we can choose also a film which we it play online we're going to play it on a big screen so it's like to to relativize a little bit the idea of a premiere world premiere even if we need to have some gala things but i always say we should make a film of the film we love that's it and bring a film to, to bring a uh, filmmakers or an actors and it's going to be a carte blanche of the film he like it can be a film from the 30s cinema it's not only cinema from 2020 which is it can be a, a film from two three years ago and people are rediscovering the film they say wow thank you for sharing this with us interesting yeah Fernando where is the strangest place where you found a movie <laughs> Strangest place. <laughs> That's a difficult one. Uh, well, most of the methods have already been described, to be honest. I, I would add here, you know, going to other festivals and understanding with time which festivals are specialized in which cinematography zone and which styles is a very important, important process especially for uh, places that, for instance, us in Portugal have a much harder time in discovering. Our film scene is very small. There's very few independent cinemas. Uh, almost the whole exhibition circuit is dominated by one company who only pretty much shows uh, American blockbusters. So, so it's really difficult to have access to uh, films from Europe, from most places in Europe, for instance, from the Baltic region or from the Balkans, etc. So, um, so this is very difficult to actually get this information. You really need to get out and discover. And with time, you 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 learn either to go to the festivals or to follow their programs and learn that each year which ones is specializing what. And that's a place that certainly we uh, we go and get a lot of our information from. Uh, as Christine was saying. Fortunately, the film industry, at least the festival circuit, it's full of people that want to collaborate with each other. So uh, you're in constant conversations with uh, your programming colleagues from other festivals, figuring out. Usually, I'm also a film critic, so I also get that from the press sites, from my uh, my critics' friend. Normally, when a critic loves a film, he's going to talk to everyone about it. He's going to try and get it to go as far as possible. So that also kind of gives me the opportunity to learn that way. Just skimming through our submissions, we get roughly every year close to 4,000 films. So just studying that gigantic list, uh, never-ending list of films, it's a way of figuring out what each country is doing, what are the themes that are being covered in that place, and understanding how the scene works. Um, and yeah, the usual stuff. We also use a lot of festival scope. It's a great tool to figure out what, what's happening, both in the short format as well as in features. Sinando as well. Um, I don't really have any strange example. <laughs> Trying oh, to figure out really? that's a difficult one. No, not not particularly strange. Obviously, you know, word, uh, word of mouth is is usually uh, a reliable source of information. Uh, but yeah, not not really strange. Sorry. <laughs> There is there is a legend about how you guys uh, make the uh, the lineup of one year. Uh, one day you just wake up and decide this year we're going to talk about um, um, I don't know uh, the the uh, immigration and then everything that you choose is films that has something to do with that or 
from all the list of the movies that you find, you think, hmm, I'm going to find the link here, like this, the magical link. How, how does it work? Yeah, I think it's a very good question because uh, three years ago, we were fascinated by the first film made in the Syrian camp. And of course I was, a. Uh, but after watching 40, 42, 50 films, it was too much for the audience, too much for me. So we lose a little bit the interest when the films are repetitive. And in terms of theme, especially in the European cinema, we are all looking for, I love drama and melodrama is my favorite style of film. But when you see only mother child drama, it's, and it's, it's, it, it's impossible to make a lineup only with film the same tone. So we need to, film, to, to find film a little bit different. It's, it's a, a question of taste, but we, I think we all agree to make it a little bit always exciting, but first for, for the audience to buy a ticket <laughs> and to, to fill the room because it's really sad when your room is not, it's, it's uh, so, but it's not easy because we are watching also a lot of films we didn't like. People yeah. think we're all, always watching films we love. Yes, of course we love cinema, but we have to watch films personally we don't like, or to TV, or, or not for us. Let's say it doesn't fit for, for us. Yeah. Christine, is that for you? Yeah, I think the mixture is very important. So we are kind of a connoisseur shop with a pâté from France and uh, some schnapps from uh, Bulgaria. And uh, so it's really important to, to find this for, we have to love the movies we present. I mean, this is the most important thing. And of course, it's not to fulfill uh, only our interests. Uh, we do it for an audience, but if I don't, uh, uh, if I'm not convinced what I'm selecting, I can't uh, trans transfer my enthusiasm about the film to the audience. So it's really important that we believe what we're doing and we want to find, uh, from our point of view, the best films or the most interesting films, cinematic, uh, social, political, uh, uh, surprising. Uh, I really like movies who uh, surprise me w w without the formula, you know? I mean, as we see so many films nowadays, I mean, a thousand films a year or whatever. So really formulas are boring uh, <laughs> after so many years. So it's really lovely to discover films when uh, you start a film and you don't know what's going on. How, how will this end? You, you have no clue. I think this, this is for me is the, the best experience ever. Uh, but it's really important to have a mixture for the audience. So not uh, 15 uh, um, refugee documentaries uh, and I like refugee documentaries, but uh, there are so many angles how you can um, how you can tell a story about refugees. So it's now really more about uh, people who are already here and how to uh, how to implement, how to to deal with this uh, new uh, uh, surrounding new societies and so on. So in general, I Frederick already pointed it out. It's really um, I always say, say hand picked selection so it's really and that's very good because if each festival has the same selection it's also boring so that the, the wonderful thing is if i go to another festival and discover a total uh, other lineup uh, or the, some overlapping but uh, that's what i really like to discover something new which was not uh, in my spectrum so it, it, it's it's very important to be open always open and curious and and yeah that that's the best uh, thing about our work right um, you know it, it, it's really interesting also because this is the way that the brain works i mean the brain always looks for the answer so we program to uh, you know in in terms of survival as you know as animals we tend to think okay what's next so when we are uh, making movies, it's the same thing. When you, know, when you make a movie and your brain knows exactly what's going to happen next, it's boring because your brain wants more and more and more. So that's what we tend to like to be surprised. Mm. Yeah, Fernando. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we do have, usually we do have a theme that uh, attempts at uh, gluing the whole program together. And that certainly um, affects significantly certain side sections that are uh, connected to that theme. But generally, and that, and that can go very wrong, and I'll give you a silly example. Last year, before the pandemic, our uh, theme was the apocalypse. And uh, as the pandemic began, we had to completely change the, the festival in three months because there was a lot of films focused on that and it didn't make any sense to make that at that time. But generally we, um, we uh, yeah, it's, it's the same principle as Christine and Frederick. Um, my perspective is that I have to imagine that there will be someone in the audience who's gonna watch every single film. So uh, if uh, I need to make sure that that experience is as varied as possible, that so we can keep going to the next screening. Um, obviously, that's very difficult, uh, especially since we're considering we're talking about a universe of roughly, I don't know, 50 to 200 films. It's it's impossible to make it that varied, but but you can. You know, you always try and find a different, even if it's the same theme. You try and look for a different tone of film, a different format, different country for sure, a different type of filmmaker, a woman, a man, etc. You can always find ways of of getting that variety, and that variety is absolutely essential. It's, it's the main thing that we focus on. For instance, our uh, feature film competition, uh, we always try and maintain, it's, you know, if you're gonna have genre cinema, you're gonna have each one of that genre, which makes it really difficult. It means that a lot of the times you do not select the films that you really want, uh, but you select the films that you really need to have <laughs> in order to have that balance. It also means that you always have to put uh, ahead of whatever interest you have, the interest of the audience, the necessities of the audience. And in our case, we have quite a varied audience. So you have to respond to a lot of different necessities. We have from uh, film students from different parts of the world to a local fisherman. So it's a pretty wide uh, group of people and group of interests. Uh, but yeah, the idea is always variety is the single most important thing, I would say. You know, it's, it's amazing when you're describing this, I'm imagining that you are rock bands, rock stars, and you have to put on a concert. <laughs> you have to get the new single out, which is the premiere. So it's something exciting for people. Uh, but then you describe some sort of a route. I'm going to take you through this journey. So right now I know that we're going to have some ballads because I want you to cry or dance. Now we're going yes. to have to rock and roll. Now we're going to have some dance. Now I'm going to disappear. Now I'll come back. So you're a little bit making a concert, but with movies, which is, which is amazing. Uh, you, you know, that selection. Yeah, festival has always a narration. I mean, uh, and the a choreography. I mean, that that's true. Um, and uh, that's what I really like uh, to have such a mixed audience, which is attracted to uh, different uh, parts of the program. And of course, a festival is, is not only watching films, it's, it's uh, talking about films, it's partying, uh, it's mingling. Um, it, it's all together. It, it's, it's this intense uh, few days you stay, uh, you just spend with with people who are um, also film buffs uh, or, or uh, just wanted to check out what's going on, it's also okay. Um, and I think this, um, this one week uh, choreography is, uh, of course, you start with an opening, you close with an award ceremony and with the award-winning film presentation. Uh, in between you have some topics, uh, highlights. Uh, so it, it's really uh, like a, a script we write also for this week. And, and how is your work as a Cicerone? Um, that responsibility of having to choose between one movie or another, one author or another. Um, how many friends and enemies have you made over the years? But it's funny I, you, you ask, sorry. Go, go, no, ahead, no. go ahead, Christine. Uh, no, I just wanted to say, I mean, it depends. We are not calm, you know? Uh, so I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not that serious. There are other options you can premiere with your film or uh, we also need only Aus an Austrian premiere. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, it, you have to imagine each filmmaker, each producer puts all his energy, all his love uh, in, in one film and each uh, rejection is uh, really hurting. And 
but I really try to to uh, to explain and not uh, bring it down to a personal level on a very professional level. And I never made the experience that someone was really, really mean because we rejected the film. But Fernando, you have found somebody. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, because we work with the first and second features and with the younger filmmakers in the short uh, sector, uh, we do get this, con this more confrontational uh, relationship more often. I think because people are, are, aren't really yet used to this rejection uh, that Christine was talking about and having fully understood the different kind of uh, alternatives and opportunities that are out there. Um, yes, this rejection is, is very complicated and I understand that filmmakers put all, all, not just all their resources, but all their energy, all their lives is focused on this. They have to understand that all of our resources and all of our lives are put on our festivals as well. So it's it's a very equal relationship. I don't I wouldn't say that you know you don't get enemies if you explain to them as things are. If you uh, make the effort to try and uh, and uh, explain how the process works, if you're as transparent as possible, that that's not a problem at all because ultimately when you're making the decision of selecting a film or not, you are going through a very long list of factors that uh, may define if a film is selected or not. And sometimes it has nothing to do with the merit of the film. Uh, you know, a film is selected because it's, uh, it's a good film in theory. If we are selecting, there's something in it that we really, really value, but uh, it has to play well with the other films. Uh, I have to have the, the right uh, set of conditions to be able to show it. Uh, a thousand different reasons. Uh, so, you know, it's very important not to take this personally. So uh, we, I wouldn't say that we have that kind of problem. We have found the right balance to do it. Um, but it's very difficult. Uh, as I mentioned before, the thing that bothers me the most is, is uh, having a film I like a lot, that I really want the whole world to watch it, and then I can't select it in my own festival which uh, really annoys me. And it's not for money reasons, it's for uh, what, what most people would consider less important reasons. But simply, you know, we, as I mentioned, we receive close to 4,000 films and we select around 150. So you're gonna have to make choices and these are gonna be hard choices. Uh, at the end of the day, what's important to understand for new filmmakers is that even if your film is not selected, doesn't mean you shouldn't go to that festival. Uh, there are so many other opportunities that you can get by going to a festival, as both my colleagues here have mentioned. It's not just about showing your film, it's about starting to work for your next film. It's about uh, understanding how specific industries work, finding new partners, finding a new DOP at a bar or at a restaurant or uh, in a corridor of uh, one of the venues. Um, film festivals are the place where the whole industry congregates. It's really the only place where the film industry congregates. So it's absolutely vital that they understand that festivals are not just a place to show their films, they're a place for to progress their careers. So. Yeah, I think uh, rejection is, uh, I mean, most of the filmmakers, they really understand because uh, most of the time it's not a question of taste, it's just because your film is in black and white and we have already three films in black and white and we want to limit it a little bit to, for 10 film in competition. So, and, and, and also we have, we're in contact with a commission, like say in Austria, of course, there is a fabulous one, but everywhere we are in contact with the um, producers, the sales agent, and rarely with the filmmakers. But if we start a conversation with the filmmaker, it's totally normal to continue. And uh, it's it, it, it's fine. Sometimes there are filmmakers coming to me with their shot, can you watch it? I say, and I say, I can watch it, we can talk about this, but I can tell you, I will be very honest. I say, wow, it's exactly what, uh, what I want. I say, yes, but I will be very honest. So it's not, a, I'm not selecting for a festival, staying, trying, because of course we have our worlds, we know how to try to, to not be rude. Sometimes we really don't like a film, but we have to be more than polite, but also, yeah. But when someone is showing you a film, they really appreciate you, the, the honesty, even if you don't like it, it's a, it's a part of the game if you, I mean, the filmmakers, I, I think it's a, our uh, opinion is important, it, it's important. And by the way, it's not my taste, it's the taste of a team of six or 10 and in, in Tribeca 40. So it's like, a, we are also sharing uh, our life of programmers. We, I'm, I'm able to change my mind. 
I'm able to program a film which I don't love, but I think we have to program the film for a reason of playing this film, like an opening film. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, sometimes being in main competition of the being the opening film is not the best thing for your film. I've seen careers. Oh, oh yeah, of course. Right? Yeah. Yeah, if, you, if you're not main for that, don't let your ego think yeah. that you're you're there for the opening film because it, go, it can be a total disaster for you, for your career and for the film's career. Exactly. But, uh, but sometimes these kind of fashion things happen, like now this is a trend, now this is fashionable. Uh, and there's kind of a phenomena that repeats periodically with, you know, uh, waves of narrative, waves of directing actors, um, subjects, for example, right? Uh, how does this happen? Yeah. I think yeah. this, Christine, please. No, I think this is a part of um, of our industry. I mean, we had the uh, Yugoslavian wave, black wave, the Romanian wave. Uh, now, hybrid is pretty uh, often part of uh, the cinematic um, narration. Uh, there, there are always a kind, I mean, I think also we, the curators, uh, create these kind of waves because um, people um, who select films, we are close, uh, they're, you know, this is kind of a hype which is starting. But uh, I, I mean, it, and it, it, it's 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 uh, it's not that it's not um, uh, that these films are not good or that that's not fair that uh, the wave is. But also, it, it, I have the impression that uh, like with the Romanian waves, one there is one key director who starts something, yeah. and then um, uh, all curators are curious what's going on in this country, and then this this motivates others. To follow, and uh, I, I think that's very interesting. And and uh, filmmaking is collaboration, and uh, film schools. Um, I mean, um, you are influenced by by film schools and what's going on there. So, but maybe um, Frederick, you can add something more serious. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not serious. Just there's also one factor which is very important for me, but probably for you, and and then people who are. I think it's uh, when we are selecting a film and in competition, the filmmakers has to come because we, if we play the film, let's say dry, I mean, if you are going to a festival is to have a QA and a and to meet the guy or the girl, or you, to meet them after, to have a drink and just to dream a little bit to, to meet someone who made a film you love and to say, I mean, without the attendee of filmmakers or, I mean, it's, it's a little bit annoying for me. Uh, to to invite a film, or minimum the, the cast, but someone. But if you have nobody for a filming competition, it's difficult, and it's happened. So uh, sometimes at the last minute, uh, the yeah. Yes, um, going back to this, uh, how this phenomenon uh, developed. I think Christine pretty much said everything. Um, I also feel that a lot of the times it's either us programmers or film critics who start these waves after wave after wave after wave. And a lot of the times it's not really a wave. It's just uh, one or two examples. They manage to have some similarities and, uh, and that's about it. I, I really like it when it does happen in an organic fashion. Uh, the example that Christine gave of Romanian cinema. Yes, it starts with one, but then obviously all the limelight or the, 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 the lens is focused on that on that direction. The Greek weird way, for instance, and uh, it's another great example. And, and it's great because it usually has a snowball effect and it affects the rest of the region. And uh, it really forces us as programmers or uh, cinephiles to go and look for what's happening there. So, so I, I actually like those phenomena a lot. Yeah. Or, I, or even filmmakers invent like dogma, you know, it's like, it was also, so it either filmmakers themselves invent a new style uh, and it became global yeah. or uh, we uh, uh, festival people or critics, um, focus on, on, on something special going on in the territory or in a, um, in a film style way or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I really like the notion of wave and we knew that from the Romanian and of course uh, Iranian wave and 
Taiwan wave. But I, I really think it's a, a film, it has to be fun enough. You can say, let's say, oh, I just saw an, a film from Argentina with no swim, swim, swimming pools because we just put the Saint-Martel. Oh, it's a French film they are not eating. Oh, this is a Turkish film where there is no uh, father-son story. Ah, yes, this is good. This is, we can show something from Portugal. This is not okay. This is a film, you know, it's, it doesn't look like a Manuel de Oliveira or, you know, yeah. they, just to, I really appreciate when filmmakers are doing something we are not looking from their country and mm -hmm. which there are absolutely no wave. So this is exciting. Otherwise you are, it, it, it seems they are repeating that themselves. But the problem is when, when an Argentinian filmmaker appears with a film without a swimming pool, we're gonna, in a year or two, we start saying, that's the new Argentinian way. Yes, exactly. exactly. Non-swimming pool films. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 very true. I, um, uh, but still, you know, it's difficult to find an equilibrium because something that excites you or you know you put a label on is let's go this way, but then try to find a equilibrium between continents and countries and have representation from uh, South America, from Africa, from Asia. From yeah, exactly. But it's like a. When things are arriving in the beginning, the tablets, iPad, okay, it was exciting for six months. And now it's just, it's, I mean, it's really not interesting. Even a conversation about an iPad, it's boring. When you see so many films that started 12, 10, 12 years ago, and it was in Sundance, and then people were texting, and then you see the text on the screen. So I'm asking the filmmakers, please try to not do it again, because now when we see, a film where two, two girls are texting, say, no, please, not again. This is also the repetition after years. I mean, filmmakers have to try to find another idea to, to tell the stories because otherwise it's gonna be very uh, acad academic, academical yeah. or conventional. I think, I think there's also a, a responsibility um, from the film institutions. Sometimes they, they tend to give funds to movies that yeah. repeat the same thing. Uh, I, yeah, I've yeah. seen something like that before. And exactly, yeah, yeah. There is certainly some conservatism in, 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 uh, in that sector. I would also add that uh, this may sound a bit silly, but uh, my perception is that a lot of young filmmakers don't watch that many films. And uh, they're watching a lot of classical films. So they end up being influenced by always the same sources. Uh, and that makes it really difficult for, for this phenomenon of, of a contemporary filmmakers feeding off each other. Uh, I get that feeling a lot. Okay. And uh, and how do how do you develop new audiences? Um, actually, so what we are starting now, what we are doing now since several years, we have young programmers. Uh, so these are um, youngsters between sixteen and eighteen. They watch a lot of films. They have their own uh, uh, program uh, section. Uh, it's called um, young programmer section with uh, feature length European films. So really. Uh, this year they selected Slalom and Gagarin and uh, titles like this. So I really let them watch uh, 25 films uh, and they select uh, six films out of it. They have to write uh, the texts, they have to do the Q&As, they have to prepare some material. Uh, this is one part. We have, of course, a youth uh, jury uh, as well and we do uh, workshops during the festival, um, so that they, they, they are making short films, uh, video workshops, then we bring professionals, they, they teach them uh, some skills, but also they, they can uh, talk with them about their profession, so like a platform to get informed about jobs in the film business. So we really try to attract um, a, a young audience to um, to be active during the festival and before the festival, but also to bring a lot of films dealing with um, you know a young or with young people in the film. So uh, our audience is also pretty pretty young, like in uh, Reykjavik. So it's really between sixty, let's say sixteen to thirty. It's it's the main uh, audience, and uh, I think that's pretty important because uh, they really change their their social socialization uh, to 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 attend uh, screenings in cinema is is gone you know 
not like us, we grew up, so every second day we have a date in the cinema, but it, this is not happening anymore. Hmm. Frederick. Yeah, no, it's a reason why also festival, I mean, distribution, I don't know where there is distribution anymore. I'm living in New York uh, half time and there is, a, of course, five, five venue in Paris. This is the best. It's, it's still working. And we have a, a network of distributors all over of France. So, but you see what's happened in England, in Germany. Uh, it's difficult, I mean, to, to uh, for, I mean, the distributors now are the festival. And I remember a long time ago when I wanted for a festival to, to meet a, a sales agent, we, were, we got the meeting only at the end of the second week, Tuesday or Wednesday. Now it's the first day, the second day, with the coffee, you have the breakfast, they invite you because they want to connect with you because they make a lot of money. This is a professional thing, but we have to rent the, the this is, uh, we have to pay. Sometimes it's quite expensive. So there is a kind of, of business behind. It's not very interesting for the filmmakers, but I think it's the, the, the distribution of the festival. And I think it's like you are going to see La Calas or you are going to see 16th century Shakespeare, you go need, you, you have to see something live, you have to be there. I'm not against the online, it was great for a year, but you have to be there. If you are not there, you have to come next year. This is, uh, and it's, it has to be, it has to be like this. And um, so when the festival, and it, we should talk, I mean, I'm not sure it's, we should talk about what we call uh, a festival film, but this festival film, you see film, they are playing here, 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 sometime 85, 90, 100 the festival are, are, are picking the same film. So if you see at the end, it's a lot of money, much more than any sales in Russia combined mm. to Spain and France for a small film, an art house film. Mm. So I think it's, uh, we, we are trying to, to personally to not, not have only festival film. It's a reason why I like also more traditional documentaries just to change a little bit and not to have uh, something which is a, a repetition of what's happened in Rotterdam. And I love Rotterdam. Huh? It's nothing to, not against uh, this great festival, but repeating exactly the same time of lineup is not extremely interesting for me. Yeah, yeah I, I agree, I agree. Uh, we have the same principle as well. Um, going back to audience development, um, we also work a lot with children and uh, obviously that's that's something that we uh, believe is really, really important to work on and we work that in uh, different formats. We also have a, a group of uh, youth jury, which is actually children's jury, uh, where they learn through a workshop format, learn how to uh, evaluate a film uh, and interpret the film in a different way and then they decide on winners. So that's a way of getting them more engaged and to think film differently. And that's been one of the most successful parts of our festival actually the, our children's section has exploded in the last five years obviously COVID-19 now has basically <laughs> stopped that for a bit hopefully and we'll go back to it very soon um, we also work a lot with uh, high schools we go into screenings in high schools which is not as easy as it sounds uh, because they do because it's very complicated to actually organize even now during COVID, we are doing this uh, and we stimulate them not just to watch films, but also do films. Uh, we're doing, just after this, I'm actually gonna go and do a session with the uh, 12 year old kids who are gonna be doing films on Zoom. So uh, we're always trying to open their perspectives uh, also to start training the film muscle, to start consuming the kind of films we want them to consume. And speaking of film muscle, because our festival, again, because we are focused on first and second features and short films, very rarely we have space in our program to put the big names, the Polanskis and uh, the, the, ultimately the names that really uh, appeal to a lot of people. So we actually created a cine club, a kino club, where we do screenings all year, all throughout the year to literally train the muscle. So by the time that they get to the festival, they are uh, kind of more eager to films that go a little a step further than these, than the usual Pandor films or uh, things like that. And I'm not obviously administering the films that are in competition in Cannes in any way, but obviously the films that we end up screening are slightly different from that. They're more adventurous, more courageous, in, and they, they exploit different avenues than those big productions. So, yeah, yeah, audience development is, is absolutely key right now. 
uh, more than ever. Uh, cinema is kind of losing a big battle right now. And uh, the festivals are at the front of this. Uh, yeah. uh, let's hope that some uh, some institutions out there uh, understand the importance of, uh, of uh, this fight and support us because uh, right now there's within the industry there's there's some changes going on that don't really necessarily help us in this uh, in this fight. Uh. Oh, I'm a mute. <laughs> I was saying that this is true for all of you who really don't know how they get financed. Sometimes um, film festivals get financed from the people that attend uh, the uh, the movies. In a year as catastrophic as this was, uh, you know, the finance goes down um, and film institutions tend to go down. And it's very important for them to understand that this is about building a community. There's nothing more uh, rewarding for a community than having a film festival. Uh, and we have three extraordinary examples right here. Guess what? It's been an hour and I could be talking with you for uh, more time, but, um, but we have five minutes um, left. And, uh, and, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, I, I, I told our guests that we were going to be making a game and the game is very simple. Um, some of some of you will probably think that you have a movie and you want to take it to the film circuit, that you want to do something with it. Some of you will go to film institutions to look for money and they will ask, what is your strategy? Okay, um, I guarantee you that 90, 99% of you and probably us um, go for the same thing. We'll start with Berlin, we'll start with Cannes, we'll start with Venice. So now I'm asking our guests here today, let's think outside the box. Let's try to think about an alternative way of promoting a first, second feature film of an author. Um, so they can give us, you know, I will start here and do this, this, this. And I think that will be very nutritious for the conversation. So Christine, shall we start with you? Yeah, of course. Um, so first of all, uh, when um, you have a new film uh, ready, Actually, I would recommend any way to, to present a new film even before it's finished uh, in the editing uh, process. would be good to uh, spread it already and, and uh, present it to people out there. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, of course, all people want to, to uh, apply uh, being Khan or we are talking now about the feature, uh, f let's say first film, feature length uh, fiction film. Uh, it could be in uh, Kansan or a certain regard or whatever, but of course uh, the competition is really uh, tough. So uh, I really would recommend, uh, of course, to ask other uh, A film festivals like uh, um, Toronto, San Sebastian, Locarno, uh, Venice, uh, Carlo Vivari. Uh, there are many A film festivals out there and all these festivals I think are also a very good starting point because they have a lot of industry there, a lot of film critics, curators and so on. So it doesn't have to be always Cannes or Berlin or Venice. There are other options as well. Uh, of course, if you get rejected by all these A film festivals, I, I'm really convinced if the film is uh, great, uh, there will be another way to promote it through festivals who really uh, are keen to invite the film. So I really would recommend go there when a festival director curator is begging you uh, to be part, uh, uh, to, to invite your film, to premiere your film. I think the, it's it's necessary to have somebody on board who is really passionate because this person will promote the film to other curators, to other film direct, uh, to other festival directors, and so on, to critics, maybe even to distributors or world sales. So uh, it must not always be the A one. It could be also the B or Plan C could be also very successful for your for the further career of the film. And to bring an example, maybe to bring an example, I mean, there are always, especially more hybrid films, which are on the first few, not these big titles, but they, uh, for example, a film from Austria is called Double Happiness by Ella Reidel. It, it was about the copy, the copying of a village in Austria, which is very famous, Hallstatt, and it was copied in China. And this film traveled 
at so many festivals. It premiered at Crossing Europe and then really internationally it, architecture film festivals, uh, all the Asian festivals, and it was really very popular documentary festival. So I think it, it's there are so many ways to start a career and it can be successful even without uh, being at the A film festival. So, okay, Frederick. Yeah, uh, I think if you go to Cannes, that's great. First, it's going to be expensive. <laughs> Second, it's going to be a success, but it can be a disaster. You need just one person saying to another, did you see this? Yes, it's crap, it's shit. And then they are talking to another one to a cocktail and you are destroyed. And then it's not, if you go to a smaller festival, you could be, they're going to take care of you. We, you need to have a buzz to have, it seems so important to have review. So it's another conversation. One day we should talk about critics, how is not doing well, but how important, and I have a lot of respect of what they are doing. So this is very important for a B or C, a D, uh, D uh, f festival. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, uh, there is also so many examples, of course, there's a stress when you are trying a selection to a festival. Sometimes a festival is not selected, and I have a good example, not selected in Sundance, not Rotterdam, not Cannes, not Berlin, not Toronto, not Carl Viva, you know. And going back to Sundance and a huge success, exactly the same film, they called New Cut. Yeah. But so people have to, uh, uh, premiering is extremely important. You don't have to, of course, if, if they offer you the competition of Cannes, you're gonna say yes. But you can choose to go to Glasgow. You can choose to go uh, to Sevilla. You can choose to go to other festival, uh, which is great. And then, especially if you are totally unknown, if we call that a gem. If, he, if the filmmaker is unknown, you did a short, you presented the short to this uh, film festival, you decide to present your film here, that, that could be extraordinary. So it's a, it's a good, good game and a good idea. Okay, Fernando. Yeah, I mean, I did, again, obviously this depends on what kind of film it is yeah. and the, the, what is the objective of the filmmakers and the producers. But um, but I would certainly advise to look, not, necess not for a film festivals, but I would advise for them to look for festivals, for instance, in European context, festivals that are supported by Creative Europe, which obviously have already been through lots of uh, um, evaluation points and have passed. So they obviously have things in it that uh, make it an important festival. Festivals that have a lot of uh, media presence as well. Again, it's very good to have a film critic on their side. He's going to do a lot for your film. Uh, festivals that have film forums in it that gather lots of professionals. They will most likely we also have programmers from other festivals, so that's kind of half of your distribution work done just by having the film present there. Uh, and festivals that are really popular with the audience, uh, which is very difficult to figure out which ones they are until you actually go there. Uh, but there are lots of events, great events all throughout Europe. New Horizons in Poland is a, is a good example. Yeah. You know, it's a very easy festival for you to be in touch with everyone and to um, and uh, everyone is in the same place. So you just go from screening to screening everybody. You end up creating a great atmosphere and everything in a very relaxed, non-VIP format. Uh, and there's many, many of those examples. Sometimes it may, may even make sense for a film to start being distributed in Latin America instead of in Europe. Uh, and then you're working in a completely different environment or Asia or whatever. So uh, there is certainly a world outside of uh, a list film festivals. And as Frederick was saying, having a film in Cannes is not necessarily good for a film. It will get you a lot of exposure, but it can very easily and most likely, it's even more likely for you to get bad exposure than good exposure. So, um, so it's a, it, it's, it can be a catch-22 situation. Right. Oh, well, well thank you very much. I, I, I wrote down uh, some of the words that you've been mentioning more than four or five times. Um, community was one of the things. It was very surprising to me. I thought we were going to, I didn't know exactly where the conversation was going to go to. Uh, but community that was very very important in in in, in the three dialogues, um, audience that was the second one. How to stimulate them? How to reach them? Uh, very interesting uh, dialogue. How to create a dialogue between uh, different parts of the world within your community within filmmakers? Uh, that was the third. 
Uh, the fourth was surprise. I'd like to be surprised. I'd like to find new things. I like to, so that's very important. And the last thing was curiosity was also very linked to surprise, but curiosity. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting because, uh, you know, having people like this today in this chat, um, their personality is also like we were saying, you know, that this, this is the song they're writing, this is the script they're writing, and they invite you to this journey through the days that the festival takes place. And so you explore different angles of a same dialogue that they, they try to have with you. Um, community, interaction, audience, stimulation, surprise. Those are your words. Uh, I cannot be more grateful to you. We have a couple of questions um, for you guys. Uh, the first one is from Lara, and she's asking, um, do, you, do you see any female wave um, out there, like in genre movies? Who wants to shoot? I, I would, I mean, um, female wave would be uh, maybe too, too, too much, but I think it's very important that uh, all the festivals now are really trying to bring more equality in their programs. Uh, so a lot of festivals signed the 50-50 pledge, which means that they try to reach uh, the quota for 50% of female directors in their program, directors, producers, scriptwriters. Um, so uh, I think it's very important to take care about uh, these um, developments and uh, with this um, demand uh, from festivals, from uh, editors, from TV, from uh, even streaming platforms, they really uh, want to have more diversity and more equality, gender equality in their programs. So uh, that means that producers are now uh, really looking uh, for more female directors and even the funding institutions have uh, quarters for, for giving uh, money to, to, a, uh, to a team with more uh, female uh, ac um, active people uh, in, in, in the, in the on board. So uh, it's like a market tool on one hand, but I think it, which is also there, there is really a new wave of female directors. For example, uh, in Kosovo, uh, just this year, three really yeah. strong young first film uh, makers have new films from Kosovo, which is wonderful. I mean, uh, a country you uh, would suppose it, it's um, yeah, very traditional, but no, I mean, uh, really tough ladies in film business are doing a great job. So I think something is changing and I think we festival curators have a responsibility to bring more the diversity, more uh, equality, more gender equality in our program and take care about it. I would add that I don't think that there is a, a, a female wave. I think there's a female tsunami coming, to be honest, <laughs> because uh, I'll give you an example. We, uh, we have a, an academic section of films made in an academic context. And the last three years, over 80% of applications are from women. Uh, from female directors, it's ridiculous. It's uh, last year we don't we didn't sign up with this uh, gender equity uh, letter or convention. Uh, it's just happening organically. Last year, sixty eight percent of our program was uh, female uh, filmmakers. Uh, there's more and more and more women making yeah. films, fortunately, more and more women studying films. And finally, they're starting to get financed. Obviously, that this doesn't mean that we should just let things happen and not really do anything about it. We need to keep paying attention and making sure that this trend continues. Uh, but from my perspective, uh, most the hardest part is done now. It's just making sure that these uh, women continue having their opportunities, and uh, and this is certainly improving films in many ways. Uh, last year our, was probably our best program ever, and as I mentioned, with sixty eight percent female directors, it certainly was worth it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a lot, but it's a, I totally understand because uh, 15 years ago, there is only few, even the female filmmaker, apart, uh, I don't know, Agnès Varda and Claire Denis, wonderful filmmakers, it's just very few. But now, since 10 years, if you see just the, the name of a female filmmaker, immediately it's going to be a little bit better because they are just starting. It's less gross. It's less. It's little bit more interesting for the mind, for the brain, for the. It's something a little bit. More, I, I don't say it's going to stay, 
but uh, I find the quality of uh, works made by uh, female director, which is good. And I like the numbers of 68 because people say, oh, let's try to have 50, 50. No, maybe we can have to 60 women and 40 men. And it's, it can happen. And uh, yes, there's, uh, there's many, many, many. And when we see, I mean, when I see a film from a country which are not really representing women, I make an effort to say, okay, let's see what's happening because I think it's very, the representation is also very important. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, we have Sergi here asking, what will, what will be surprising for you to see on a Spanish film? <laughs> difficult one <laughs> okay i mean i think spanish films are uh, also very diverse i mean i've seen so many different spanish films i mean a typical is uh, a spanish genre like uh, rec or uh, alex de la iglesia or this kind of stuff but uh, there are also experimental films and uh, great documentaries i mean i i see the whole range of of uh, approaches in Spanish cinema, so uh, nothing really would actually surprise me, I would say. Uh, I don't know. I love uh, Spanish cinema from Chrono Criminals to Fernando Trueba, which is fantastic. By the way, he started in a small section in Carlo Ivari and it's a huge success all over the world. The, the son of Trueba, the, the Madrid thing, which is very Romerian. So it's, now it's very diverse. There is no more ghost on your film. There's no, it's changed a little bit. So the Spanish cinema is very modern. And also there is a Basque, a Catalan, I'm trying to understand. And it's very important for me to try to understand the region and the style, uh, what's happened in Barcelona and in Madrid, which is in a way different, but I think it's, I, I, I try to make some research and to think about Albert Serra, which I love, and to think about other filmmakers from Madrid, and trying to find, so it's extremely diverse and very surprising. They are also doing good series, as, as you know. So, so, yes, I think it's a, one of the country always proposing something uh, extremely exciting uh, these days. I agree, and I, I would. A couple of years ago, we could perhaps say that uh, there's parts of Spain that weren't necessarily really represented in the yeah. in the, the national cinematography. Galicia was a good example, but the last couple of years has been a total explosion of cinema in Galicia. So uh, even that, I, I I agree. I don't. Nothing would necessarily surprise me uh, yeah. anymore on Spanish cinema, and that's a great thing. That's not a good thing <laughs> in this case. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we need to wrap up here. Um, thank you again to Fernando, Frederic, Christine. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you today. I hope that you guys enjoy it and that you took something home with you. Um, as I mentioned before, if you take home that film festivals build a community, stimulate audiences, surprise you, and brings you the world to where you are, uh, I think that's worth the effort and that's destroying a myth that a film festival is something different. Again, thank you to uh, our guests. Thank you to the DEA Film Festival, to Carlos, uh, best of luck with this uh, edition 2021. And thank you all for watching. Thank you, Bye. David. Thank you. Thanks for thank having you. us. Bye-bye.